Hi, my name is Emily. I'm a software engineer at New Relic. Uh, I want to talk to you tonight about diversity in tech with a little uh, different, slightly different angle perhaps than you've encountered before. Uh, diversity in tech is becoming um, a really big conversation in the tech industry right now. And I'm really excited by this. I'm really excited that it's become a big conversation. Um, and at the same time, I think the conversation tends to stay pretty surface level. It tends to be about the tech hiring problem. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And I'm also going to talk about uh, just one of the many ways that we can support a diverse tech industry uh, at a more root cause layer. Um, I do want to preface and say I'm not going to be talking about why diversity in tech is important. Um, I would like us to have the starting assumption that we want tech that is representative and inclusive of all kinds of people and that there are valid moral business and social reasons why. So that is our starting assumption. Let's see if this is going to work. It works. OK, <laughs> so a little bit about me. Um, I went to Hackbright Academy. That's a boot camp in San Francisco that is only for women. I graduated in 2014. I'm also involved in uh, the Social Justice Fund. Or I'm, in, I'm a PDX chapter leader of Resource Generation. I'm also a member of Social Justice Fund. Both of these are organizations that work on social justice issues using a racial justice lens. Um, and this is connected to why I'm really passionate about diversity in tech. So in my experience, a lot of women that I come across went into the tech sector later in life, often through boot camps. And I know that a boot camp degree is not the same as a four-year degree. They are totally different things. And at the same time, I find it very interesting that a lot of women are coming to tech later and not going the university route. Um, Hackbright, the school where I went to, is actually doing more to get women into tech than the top universities are. They graduate more women software engineers than Stanford and UC Berkeley combined. I find this a very significant fact. Um, I was interested in HTML and CSS in high school, played around a little bit, never ever considered going into any kind of technical career. Um, and I feel very lucky that I was able to go to Hackbright and enter the tech world. So for me, diversity in tech is about enabling other people to do what I have done, which is to enter this pretty amazing industry. Um, I do want to make a quick caveat, uh, which is that, uh, and I think this quote says it pretty well, that white women tend to be the proxy for all diversity. And as a white woman, I will stand here and say, I have mostly overheard conversations about gender diversity in tech. So for today, I'm going to intentionally try to put a little more focus on race and class when talking about diversity in tech. So the next 20 minutes, we're going to look at what is the problem? What are we trying to solve? Um, where is the problem coming from? And I'm going to do a little root cause analysis, focusing a little bit more on race and class as to uh, the lack of diversity in tech. Then I'm going to talk about a solution. There are many, but I'm going to talk about one. Um, and talk about what we in this room can do about the root causes of the lack of diversity. Um, why tech? Who's already doing work on this? And what we can do to support it. So part one, what's the problem? Lack of diversity in tech. So here is a helpful chart. Um, you can see some major companies. And they're broken down by gender and racial diversity. Uh, this, um, this says a lot, <laughs> and it's actually pretty representative of what the industry as a whole looks like, which is 82% men, 18% women, also 50% white, 41% Asian, and only 2 or 3% Hispanic and African American. So uh, to put this in context of what the US population looks like, this is what it would look like if it was truly you know, exactly matching the US demographics. Um, and the highlighted and red groups are the underrepresented groups. Um, before I go any further, I just want to say that, yes, these are big picture statistics. Like This does not reflect everybody's experience. And probably many people in this room have really struggled to be in tech, regardless of what group you're in. You know, your story may not be represented in these numbers. Um, that being said, what these show are system-wide patterns, like patterns that emerge at a much larger level than the individual. So that's what I want to focus on today. Where is the problem coming from? Uh, that is the next layer of our puzzle here. Where is the lack of diversity coming from? And the classic answer to that question 
that a lot of tech companies give is that there's not a good pool of job applicants. You know, the, where are the women? They're missing. Where they're missing from the pipeline. Um, there's a supply problem framing, um, and I want to explore that a little bit before going beyond it. Okay, the leaky tech pipeline. You have childhood education is one place where we're leaking people. You have higher education, and you have the tech industry itself. And that one tends to be a little less covered. So we'll look at that in a little more depth. OK, childhood. We're starting, starting at the very uh, first section of the pipeline. In a 2008 survey of American college-bound teens, 1,400 students were asked, is computing a good career choice for someone like you? 67% of boys said good or very good, and that was across race. Uh, and girls, 26% good or very good, but 47% said bad. Um, sorry, I'll have to yeah, I'll wait on. What year that was. Oh, 2008. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so this is already sad news. Some more sad news. Um, the same report looked at girls' and boys' associations with the word computing. And they saw that girls associated it with typing, math, boredom, and nerd. And boys associated it with video games, design, electronics, solving problems, and interesting. So clearly, we are losing a huge group of people right off the bat, right You know, from an early age. And this um, was something that a coworker sent to me today, uh, a tweet of a mom, or a tweet by a mom who took pictures of her kids' Lego subscription magazines. One was sent to her her son, and one was sent to her daughter. I'll let you guess which was sent to which. Um, the daughter was pissed. <laughs> OK, the next step in the leaky tech pipeline, higher education. I think this, uh, this chart says a lot. So there was a peak of women in computing in the, uh, in the mid-1980s. And since then, it has been on a decline, unlike every other uh, industry that's pictured here, medical school, law school, physical sciences. So What's going on, tech? What's happening? An interesting correlation is that um, personal computers started to be marketed um, for personal use in the mid-1980s, and they were marketed exclusively to boys. And it's interesting that that overlaps with this decline in, uh, in women who code. Another interesting fact, uh, a lot of times we'll hear about the supply problem, like where are the candidates? Um, there are candidates who are being left out there. Uh, this is a graph showing the percentage of, um, of staff by race at seven major tech companies. And you can see that only half of the available graduates who are black or Hispanic are being hired. And this is, this is including you know, graduates from prestigious universities. There are 50% of them who are not getting a job. Um, and I believe that this shows lingering racial bias. OK, next step in the tech pipeline. Um, we're looking at inside the tech industry, who is actually staying? You can see up here, 17% uh, of men leave tech mid-career, 41% of women. Um, in a research study that was done with 5,000 women in the sciences, um, they were all asked why they had left. You know, only 38% of them were still working as engineers of those 5,000. The ones who had left said, it's the climate, stupid. That's why we left. Um, that means, broken down, there is a cultural emphasis on male proficiency in logic and math. Uh, there tends to be a hostile, or there can be a hostile work environment, including sexual harassment or double standards. And there are also management practices where um, biases against women tend to prevent their promotions. So women leave these industries that are otherwise a really good, you know, a really good career because they are not able to make the kind of progress that they want to see. Um, and it's it's especially interesting to think about because there's a lot of emphasis on bringing new engineers into this pipeline. But they're leaving. And what's the point of bringing them in if they're just going to leave? Um, you would have to massively you know, increase your hiring rate of women, for example, just to even keep the same number. But that doesn't really get to the root of the problem. Um, and it's, it's the root of the problem that I really want to talk to you about today. So we've just looked a little bit at the pipeline that's often talked about as the source of this diversity problem. It's not the source of the problem. It's a symptom. So what are the root causes of this leaky pipeline, uh, and why does it exist? We're going to use some root cause analysis to look at this. Uh, so 
an analogy for root cause analysis, if you're a doctor, you can look at symptoms and you can treat symptoms, but the symptoms will keep coming back unless you address the root cause of that problem. And similarly in software, you have a bug in your system or something goes wrong, if you just layer on fix after fix, like if else this, you know, like catch this error, like you're just gonna keep stacking on those symptom addressing fixes and never get at the root problem. Um, so I wanna use a tool called Five Whys that you may have heard of uh, to look further at this tech diversity issue. I'm gonna do three whys for time's sake. Um, and five whys is basically you start out with your top level symptom and you say, well, why that? And then why that? Why that? That's what we're gonna do. So uh, choosing an artificially narrow focus, again, for the sake of time, um, we're just gonna look at childhood education, that first piece in the pipeline, and we're gonna say, why aren't diverse students entering the pipeline? Um, and I would argue it has to do with unequal access to quality education and computer science education. So, unequal access. Um, computer science is chronically underfunded in schools. There's a lack of qualified teachers and solid coursework. It's not just even about the hardware. Lots of schools do provide computers, but what kind of support for learning do they provide? Um, there's also an issue with what those kids can do with their learning. Only 17% of schools even offer a computer science advanced placement course. Um, and fewer than 65% have an introductory computer science class at all. Uh, there's also the issue of distance and time playing a factor into who has access to these computer classes. In a study done in West LA, researchers noticed that students of color traveled long distances to get to school and may, like, couldn't even stay for the extracurricular classes and hang out with like-minded students because they had to go. Um, so there's also this biasing in that respect as well. Even if you did have the physical access, do you have the support? This quote comes from that same study done in West LA, where the computer science teacher turned to her only black female student and said, you know what, when it comes to computational skills, you either have it or you don't have it, so maybe you should drop the class. Um, and it's those kinds of, uh, those, that lack of support that ends up building into the large patterns that we're seeing. So why do some students have unequal access to education? And again, just artificially narrowing our focus to um, a race and class analysis here, um, I would say because the school is underfunded and parents don't have the resources to send their kid to a better school. So we're gonna look at one case study of that real quick from San Francisco, the land of inequality in some respects. <laughs> Um, this is a graph or a chart showing um, PTA fundraising in elementary schools, so parent-teacher associations. In the last 10 years, California has undergone massive budget cuts to schools, and the result has really appeared in, in parent fundraising. Um, in the last 10 years, parent fundraising has skyrocketed 800%. So parents are filling in the gap that the state is no longer um, providing for. Out of $5 million that were raised, the top 10 PTAs raised half of that, the next 26 raised the other half of that, and the bottom 35 PTAs raised almost nothing. So you can see how um, when there's unequal access to wealth, that ends up having a direct impact on the kind of quality education that's available. You would think, perhaps, that uh, state governments could counteract that um, unequal effect. Schools are funded with property taxes, um, and the problem with that, of course, is that with poor neighborhoods, you end up not being able to fund the schools as well. Um, and government funding is supposed to kind of fill in those potholes, you know, go to the schools where there's more need. But if you actually look at what's happening, um, and this is a graph that's showing a fairness ratio, so to speak, of um, what states are doing versus what they should be doing, they are actually not distributing the money that would be necessary to make things fair. So children who are attending school in poorer districts actually do have less access to resources than children in richer districts. And as you saw with the PTA funding slide previously, you know, that is not being corrected. This has a very real impact on education and schooling. Um, this chart shows the percentage of fourth graders who are not proficient in reading, um, and it's uh, broken down by income as defined by who's qualified for uh, free breakfast or free lunch, sorry. Um, and you can see there is actually a massive gap 
in the proficiency level broken down by income. So kids are not you know, escaping unscathed from this inequality. This is actually pretty serious. OK, well now we're reaching our next layer here. Um, so why do some families or communities not have access to wealth? Uh, because they face huge barriers. They face uh, cultural barriers, political barriers, economic barriers, and it's often related to race, class, and gender. So what this looks like, um, it can look like active bias or racism. Uh, you may have heard of a study done where uh, researchers created identical resumes and then put either a African-American sounding name or a white sounding name on the resumes and saw who got a callback. And uh, twice as often, the white sounding names were given a callback. Um, the same outcome actually happens with men and women. So if you put a male name and a female name and send those out, the men get called back way more often. Um, and there is intersectionality here. So you can imagine if you're a woman of color, you know, your chances are just like, they're not good. <laughs> and that's a, that's, a, that's a symbol of the active bias that still goes on. Um, this graph is one that like really hit me hard when I first saw it. Um, it's another dimension of the barriers that people face. And uh, it's looking at the racial wealth gap. So what you have is the amount of wealth broken down by race, um, where wealth is assets minus debts. Um, so you know, you're getting the net, the net amount that somebody owns, which is a much more powerful indicator than income, because income doesn't take your debt into account. This does. Um, one really interesting thing about this graph is you can see the blue pillar was uh, taken in 2005, and the red pillar is 2009. And what happened between 2005 and 2009? There was an economic crisis. Uh, and I find it um, really, really sad and really powerful that while white families lost 15% of their wealth on average, uh, Hispanic families lost 66% and black families lost 50%. Um, and it just shows you how, uh, how historic um, disadvantages perpetuate even today. So, kind of on a sad note, uh, let's take a step back and look at our oversimplified whys. Um, we saw that there's a lack of diversity in tech, and we traced it back looking at all these different factors that ended up creating that lack of diversity right down to the uh, cultural and political and economic barriers that stop people from um, entering the tech world, for example. Obviously, it's much bigger than tech, but if we're going to start with that point as our problem, we see that this plays a big role in it. OK, so what can we do? Um, root cause analysis is about identifying problems where you can do something about it. Otherwise, there's no point. Um, and all of the things on this slide are things that we have power to change. Um, you see personal change, cultural change, and political and institutional change. Um, often, the focus is on personal change, um, something like managers, be aware of your implicit bias, coworkers, be conscious of your actions, recruiters, use inclusive language so you're not using like rock star to you know, try and attract all kinds of people to your job. Um, and this is incredibly important work. Personal work is incredibly important. Um, after all, 41% of women are leaving the tech industry after they get there. So we know that there's, uh, there are interpersonal factors at play. But there are system reasons, system level reasons also, why we see the lack of diversity in tech. And it's those that I want to talk about. Um, so looking at cultural and, and uh, policy change. So just the last few minutes of this talk, I want to talk about just one way that we as individuals can help address policy level and cultural root causes of the lack of diversity. Um, and again, this is not a comprehensive list of solutions. It's just one that I am really excited about. So here's my proposal, written both English and in Ruby. Um, <laughs> many of us in this room are tech workers, or soon to be tech workers, or you know somebody who's a tech worker. Um, and as such, we all have access to tech salaries. Um, I am really excited about spending some of that money at the root cause level. Um, one thing I want to point out here about this 150 multiplier, uh, that's meant to be in dollars, but if you put a dollar in front of it, it becomes a global variable, so I didn't do that. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, thank you for pointing that out, by the way. Um, so the reason it's times 150 is that um, a study of philanthropy in the Northwest found that for every dollar invested in advocacy or civic engagement, you get back $150 in benefit for the community that's being impacted. So for example, if you give a dollar to an organization that's fighting for food stamps, the end result is that there are $150 worth of benefit because the food stamps law was passed, something along those lines. Um, so I think that's an incredibly powerful opportunity, um, and especially powerful for tech. Tech has a lot of money. <laughs> there is a lot of money flowing into tech from venture capital. Um, there's you know, $835 billion that's being generated in the information sector, which includes the software engineering uh, industry. Um, but more important for people like us who you know, may not be running companies yet, um, is that we're in-demand tech employees and we have a lot of power and job security. We also are very visible members of society. Um, we're educated, uh, we're, we have like prominent thought leaders who are out there. Um, many of us are well connected. You don't have to be a Sheryl Sandberg or Bill Gates to really have an impact. You are already part of a group of people that has a lot of power and it's up to us to decide what we do with that power. I think there's a huge opportunity to really make things change at a root cause level as tech workers at this moment in time. Um, and tech is already giving. Um, in this chart from 2013, you can see Mark Zuckerberg gave a billion dollars in Facebook stocks to the Silicon Valley Community Foundation. Um, this was just for 2013 alone, so it doesn't take bigger picture uh, donations into account. Um, but I think it's pretty significant that the top 40 philanthropists in the US are, are starting to be dominated by young tech people. And uh, Mark Zuckerberg and his wife Priscilla Chan are actually the number one philanthropist in the country. Um, so this to me is another symbol of opportunity. Intel is putting $300 million towards increasing their workforce's diversity. What happens if they put $300 million at policy change that makes schools more equitable, for example, like the impact would be huge. And 300 million is a ton of money for that kind of work. It's really, it would have a huge impact. Uh, one thing I want to talk about on a more local level is what social change looks like in the Northwest. Um, and these are all organizations that are either uh, in Washington or Oregon or Montana, Wyoming, the Northwest. Um, and what they all have in common is that they are working at a root cause level to address racism or disparities by gender or class. Um, so what that can look like is developing youth leadership to get the continued growth of movements over time. It can mean advocacy at all levels of government for sweeping policy impacts. Um, you also have community empowerment and training that shares knowledge and builds power in communities that have historically not had power. And all of these organizations are amazing, and uh, you can see more about all of them um, online. I work with one of these uh, social change organizations called Social Justice Northwest, as I mentioned at the beginning. Um, social Justice Fund is a member-driven foundation that uh, funds social justice work. So all the organizations on that previous slide are also partly funded by Social Justice Fund. Um, and here you can see a subset of members uh, who are fundraising and grant making with this organization to help this social change work continue. Um, we're currently raising $100,000 to fund these organizations. Um, it's a really diverse group of people that is doing this work. It's half people of color, half white, from all different backgrounds. But we're banding together to raise this money and we're actually probably two thirds of the way there, maybe more at this point. Um, and when you're talking about small social change organizations like the ones on the previous slide, $100,000, even broken up into $10,000 chunks, goes a really long way. I think there's a misconception that nonprofits use money wastefully. Um, that is not true. There may be a few bad apples in the barrel. Um, these organizations are small and scrappy, and like startups, you know, they're going to make it as efficient as possible. Um, and I am also invested in this movement. I'm giving money to this movement. And that's one reason why I'm making this proposal to you today is that I feel very strongly about it. Um, so what can you do? Um, and this, this brings me to the conclusion of my talk. Again, this is one solution. This is one way to get involved. But if you're interested in diversity in tech, 
I highly recommend thinking about root causes. You know, something to consider when you're deciding where to give money. It doesn't have to be a huge gift. You know, remember that every dollar is multiplied in its effect. You can also volunteer your time with these organizations. You know, it doesn't have to be a monetary gift. There are people who are looking for that influx of energy that can help make this happen. Um, and finally, a, a last next step that I would like to propose is have coffee with me so we can talk about this further because this was a, you know, I'm trying to like compress information. Um, and I would love to hear your ideas and I would love to talk more about mine. Um, so in conclusion, this was a presentation about how social justice relates directly to tech diversity. Um, if you want to see more of my slides, which cite all the studies that I was talking about, um, you can find them at bit.ly tech diversity slides. Um, you can also poke me on Twitter. Um, and if you're really excited about Social Justice Fund, you know, just in case, here's a link to their website here. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, yeah, is there time for questions? I think we should move on to lightning talks. We have some. We have people. Yeah. Ellie, one of the things you might want to put up there so that people remember is that a lot of companies, the companies you guys work for, uh, will match your donations to certain uh, nonprofits up to a certain amount, and that can make a huge difference. Mm -hmm. uh, the second is please remember perspective. And I'm going to you know, assume that they care. But the chances are that most of the people in this room are making between two and three times what the average person makes. And I can guarantee you that $10,000 to somebody that makes $20,000 a year is a much bigger deal than $10,000 is to somebody that makes $100,000 a year. Because it's in your pocket, it's food, it's not what you get a new air, Mac Air, you know, whatever you're, you're going to buy this year. It's food, it's clothes, it's whether your kids have uh, a computer that they can use. And uh, it really makes a huge difference when you get down to the level she's talking about. Uh, so maintain some perspective about the privilege that you have. You've got great skills, you're earning it, but it, there's a big disparity there between most of the people that are within 50 miles of you. Yeah, thank you for pointing that out. Um, any other questions? I, I kind of wanted to make a point. I have a friend who's a high school teacher in Rainier Beach up in the Seattle area, which is a pretty poor area. Um, and he, he, um, he brings up an interesting point often Yeah, I, I actually really like that point. Um, and I do think that tax justice is extremely important and is a, a sort of at the root cause layer, like you're saying. You know, there's this lack of funding that is the reason why there are a lot of problems. Um, so one way that philanthropy can help with that is by funding organizations that are fighting to have that tax loophole filled in, for example. Um, but I agree with you that in an ideal world, you know, nonprofits wouldn't need to exist because those needs would be filled. Other questions? Yes. Why did you talk more about the oppression of white men? <laughs> <laughs> Never mind, I don't need to answer that. <laughs> If you came over here and I pushed down on your head, I would be literally oppressing you. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks so much. Thank you.